Hey guys, what's going on? It's Clever Ticky, and in this video we're gonna continue covering top 100 PHP functions. So we're gonna cover function 21 through 30, which you see highlighted here. So let's go ahead and start with dir name. All right, dir name is a function that returns a parent directory's path of the current directory. So it returns a string, and we provide a path as a string uh, for the first parameter. And then for the optional parameter, we can provide an int uh, for the levels to go up from the current directory. And um, levels was introduced since uh, PHP 7. All right, let me show you how it works. So I've created a file here, PHP functions 21 through 30.php. And I'm just going to get the current directory here where the file is located. Just gonna copy and paste this directory here for now. And so if I wanted to get the parent directory of this current directory where the file is located, so the parent directory would be this part. Here's where I could use their name. Paste the current directory. And I'm just gonna use the break at the end here. And so And so we get the clocalhost.php, which is the parent directory of the current directory, as you can see here. All right, so let's see what happens when we use levels. So by default, it's one level. Let's do two. Then it goes up another one, another directory. And if we use three, it goes up, it goes up all the way to C, which is uh, the root directory of our current directory. So that parameter is optional. We can leave it uh, blank as default. Also, we can use, in order to get the current directory, we can use a PHP constant named dir, like this. So that will get us the current directory uh, of the, f uh, the current directory where the script is being run. So combining the two, we can also do echo dir name and then current directory, which will do the same thing of getting the parent directory uh, as we did here. So it'll do the same thing. And uh, in my opinion, it's a cleaner way of um, basically it's uh, much shorter and cleaner way of uh, getting the parent directory and the current directory where uh, the script is located. Okay, so where is this, where can this be useful? So let's suppose we have another file here uh, inside the same folder. And um, for example, if we wanted to create some kind of a settings file, like database settings, gonna include some random text here and now uh, let's suppose we wanted to include the file so we could do the following include project settings and then we can just say include once so include once is a construct it's not a function it's important to differentiate this part and then we can just say dir and um, settings.php so remember that constant dir is the current directory so it will get this current directory and then attach settings.php and include that file that way so that's the best way that's the best way to include the file like that um something went wrong dir settings.php so let me just make sure that the file is in fact uh, I created the file in the wrong directory okay so let me create it again and now settings file has been included all right 
okay so we're including the settings file and um, this is a really clean way of including whatever file that you want to include okay so <clears throat> another way is to use dir name with the constant dir if we wanted to include a file from say uh, the parent directory so if I create a suppose our project had a global settings file so this is the file that's inside the parent directory which I've already created here so that would be the global settings file which will uh, influence the whole project so we can say include once dir name and then the constant dir so that will this part will get the parent directory and now we can just attach the file name to that and that will include the global settings file so now global settings has been included so it's just a way to go up one directory to the parent directory and uh, without having to specify the actual directory name uh, so it's a really good way of uh, including settings files in this way all right so that is their name let's go ahead and continue to the next function which is function exists all right so let me just uh, paste this here next one is function exists okay so just like the name says it checks if the function exists and we can go ahead and run so the return value of this function is going to be a boolean so 0 or 1 and the function is provided as a string so we can go ahead and run it on dear name and say function exists dear name so we know that the function exists so it should print out one which is true however uh, if we run function exists on include once remember that include once is not a function it's a construct so that's going to be false so nothing is printed out okay and um, so that's how that works and also this obviously works on user defined functions as well so um, as you can see I defined a user defined function here called pre r so that function should exist pre r alright prints one so that means the function exists and um, so let me give you an example of where function exists could be useful so suppose we had an array called games and I'm just gonna define a bunch of uh, bunch of games here along with the genres. So for the RPG, so we had Mass Effect 3, MMORPG, very popular game named World of Warcraft, strategy, one of my favorite strategy games, StarCraft 2. All right, so we could print this array using uh, print r function which will look like this right but pre r is better because it prints out the pre uh, html tags and so then the function is easier to read without having to go to view page source and um, so we can do we can um, run function exists on pre r to check if it if it's a defined function and then we can just use pre r to print out the games and if it doesn't exist we can just use the default print r function and print the games in that way so function exists is going to check for pre r if it exists it's going to use pre r and print print the games with the pre tags and if it doesn't exist it's just going to use print r which is the default way of printing the array in php so since the function exists you can see that it used pre r with the pre tags all right so that's one of the ways to use that function let's go ahead and move on to the next one which is array map and this is a really 
awesome and powerful function. So let's take a closer look at it. All right, so array map applies the callback to the elements of the given array. And so <clears throat> it returns an array, as you can see here. Then it accepts the callable callback function as a string. And then you sp we specify the array to apply the callback function to. And the way the callback works is it, um, it's as you can see here, it's run for each element in each array. So we can specify as many areas as we like, and the callback function is going to be applied to each element of the array. All right, so let me uh, give you an example so this makes more sense. So the easiest way to understand this function, uh, suppose we have a function called square which accepts one parameter and all it does is uh, returns a squared number so it's number times number like this okay so whenever we pass a number to this function it will return the number in a squared form then uh, let's suppose we have a numbers as an array and in it we have a bunch of numbers 1 through 10 like this so here's where we can use array map so we can say array map then we call our square function as a callback and remember that the callback is gonna run on each of the array elements so it's gonna go ahead and pass all these um, elements t as this number here and it's gonna multiply each number to itself so it's gonna square all the numbers so all we have to do is provide a callable function and then the array which is numbers and that will do the trick so let's go ahead and pre pre r the whole result because remember that the function returns an array and now we got all of our numbers squared 1 4 9 16 uh, etc so hopefully you can see how that works so so square is the function is our callback function and uh, the numbers is the array to run the callback on passing all the values through the callback all right so that's how that works and uh, we can also combine multiple arrays so let's create some more arrays let's suppose we have movies array and I'm just gonna list some of the, my favorite movies. And uh, let's also create an array with the genres. So here I'm just creating an array which corresponds to the movies array. And so here, The Matrix is a science fiction, Braveheart is action, Limitless is thrill thriller, and Interstellar is drama. Uh, let's also create another array called Years. And here I'm gonna create the years where the movies have been released. Alright, so now we have three arrays, and... Um, how can we use array map on these arrays? We can create a function and uh, let's name it show movies. And it's going to accept all the three arrays as its parameters, right? So it's going to accept movie element, genre, and the year. And then we can combine all of that here and we can print movie is genre and was released in year then we can say array map call the callable uh, function which is show movies and then provide all the arrays that we created earlier movies genres 
and years. So remember that the callable function once again goes through all the elements of the array. So when you're providing the arrays here, the number of arrays is obviously has to uh, match the number of parameters which the callable function accepts. So we can see that the, the the we have three parameters here inside of show movies, and uh, we also pass in three arrays. So let's print out the function to see what we get as a result here. And uh, you can see that it created another array. The matrix is science fiction and was released in 1999. And uh, it's printing out all the movies and uh, their array values. And another way of using this function is we can actually use a null for the callable function. So instead of providing callable function, we can just use null. And then we can create what is called an array of arrays just by doing that, just by passing all the arrays. So now you can see that it created the array of all those arrays that we're combining. So the matrix is science fiction and it was released in 1999 is the first key and then we have all the the other arrays combined as well. So that's another way of using this function and that's it for the array map. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So the next one is get class. And then we have class exists and is object. So all these three functions are for object oriented programming. And um, let's go ahead and cover those now. So, okay, so the get class returns the name of the class of an object. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new class here. For example, let's suppose we have a class called animal. And uh, it's just an empty class for now. And then, okay, so the easiest way to understand this is uh, let's just create an object. And the way we create an object in object-oriented programming is with a keyword new and then the name of the class. So now tiger is an object of class animal and we can use get class on tiger to get the name of the class so you can see that the class of the tiger is animal okay so we can also use get class from within the class itself so Suppose we had a function inside the class called class name. Uh, so we can uh, use this function to print out the actual class name from within the class. So we can say echo my class name is, and then we can use get class. But here, instead of the actual tiger as the name of the variable, we just use dollar sign this which is uh, how we access objects from within the class. So now we can just say echo tiger class name. And that should do the same thing as before and print out my class name is animal. So basically, here we're doing this outside of, of uh, a class. It's called an external call. And here it's considered an internal call because it's called from within the class itself. All right, so another example is um, if we have um, abstract class. So abstract class species. Let's say it had a function, let's say it had a uh, construct function, which is automatically called when the object of this class is created. So we have a construct. And here from within the construct, we can say get class, this. And we can also say get class like this. So suppose class animal extends species 
so it will copy all, everything it will copy all the functionality that the species has that's what extends does so now if uh, let's see what happens when we run program now so now it's printing animal species animal so first when the okay so that when the tiger object is created it first runs the construct because construct is automatically run when the class when that new object of that class is created so it goes get class of this and since this is an animal object it first prints the animal but then it looks and uh, it uh, prints out get class again from within the species and that class name is species it's not an animal so so that's why it's printing out species instead of animal alright so hopefully that makes sense and uh, I just wanted to show you guys another uh, um, bonus here so if we wanted to create a constant from within the class we could use this is how we would do it because uh, the constant that I've created here earlier does not work from within the class we have to actually create it uh, inside the class itself and then the way to access it from within the class is with a keyword called self and then double colon and then the actual constant name so that's that's how we would do it and then that just makes the whole printing e uh, easier to look at all right so that's get class the next function is if uh, class exists so this one is really easy and self-explanatory just checks if our class exists so we can say if class exists and then animal as a string now we can define a new class we can create an object if the class exists like this and uh, that's about it for class exists um, there's nothing else to it alright so the next one is is object which checks if uh, the variable is object another self-explanatory function so it just gets the name of the it's uh, finds whether a variable is an object and returns the value as a boolean so it's going to be zero or one so let's go ahead and um, run this function on our object so we can uh, use a ternary operator here and say echo is object cat which we've created earlier so it's gonna check if uh, the the variable is an object and then we can print out the variable is an object otherwise the variable is not an object all right let's see what it does and the variable is an object also we can go ahead and combine get class so we can say the variable is an object and we can say um, get class cat and uh, the variable is an object of class so now it's printing out the variable is an object of class animal because we're using get class to get the class of the object all right so that's it for the all the object oriented get class class exists and is object let's move on to the next function which is time all right so I'm gonna cover date and time together because um, they're closely related so let's see what PHP manual says about time okay so <laughs> it returns the current time measured in the number of seconds since the Unix epoch which started in January 1st 1970 <laughs> okay so if we just did if we just printed out time by itself 
it's not very useful because then we just get uh, some random looking integer. So a practical example of uh, time could look something like this. So suppose we wanted to get time a week from now. So we could say next week equals time, which is the current time right now, which is the integer that we've seen, plus 7 times 24 times 60 times 60. So in this case, 7 is 7 days, 24 is 24 hours, 60 then is 60 minutes, and then 60 seconds. So basically, using time, we can provide the exact amount of uh, days, hours, minutes, and seconds uh, that we want to set the time in the future or whatever that we're trying to do. But then we can use a function called date. And then once we have this, we can use a date function to format our time so that it's uh, readable by the user. So we can say date, and then date takes in the, the formatting like this. So it's going to format our time with a year, month, and day. And then we can pass next week to it. And that should print out the time a week from now. So let's see what happens. All right, so today's date is uh, November 1st. So it's printing out November 8th, which is exactly a week from now. All right, so that's one way of uh, using time and date. And uh, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to do this. So use um, date with a, the same format. And then we can just use a function called str to time and um, do plus one week. And that will do exactly the same thing as above without having to do all of this math here. So we can just say plus one week using the str to time function. And as you can see, it does exactly the same thing. Also, let me give you some more examples of how to use str to time. So. can also say plus three days just copy the whole thing here plus one month so as you can see it did the uh, uh, plus one week, plus three days, and plus one month. So it's just an easier way to <clears throat> to set uh, the time in the future if we wanted to do that in our code uh, instead of using times math. All right, so the next function is JSON in code. And this function is useful when we want to convert a PHP array into a JSON encoded array. So let me give you an example. So uh, let's just uh, run this function on some of the existing arrays that we've created earlier. So, for example, movies. So this is the original movies array. That's how it looks like. And uh, we can just say JSON encode movies. And uh, this is the format that you'll get, which will make it easier to work uh, with JavaScript. So it's gonna put it's gonna put the array in square brackets. It's going to put uh, the array values or yeah array values inside double quotes and separate them by comma like that okay so if we had another array let's say like this we can do JSON code movies I mean array So that's how it would print out the array with associative keys. As you can see, it's got the curly brackets, then the, the key of the array separated by colon, and then the array value. So I'm not going to get into too many details on, uh, on uh, about this. Uh, just uh, remember that JSON encoded arrays are a lot more easier to work once we start working with JavaScript. So that's uh, why it's 
why it's one of the popular functions um, because it's often that we need to convert PHP arrays into into um, JavaScript arrays that are uh, easier to work with in JavaScript. All right, so that is JSON in code, and the last function is is null, which is pretty self-explanatory. Once again, it just checks if uh, the variable is null. So if we have a variable and uh, we specify null, that is what's considered the null variable. So we can say is null variable the variable is null. Otherwise, the variable is not null. Just like that. So let's see if the variable is null. The variable is null. And so this is not the same thing as uh, variable equals empty string, for example. So this is not a null. This is an, uh, a variable with an empty string. So you can see that the variable is not null. Also, if the variable has not been defined, it's also going to be null. But you'll also get a notice undefined variable. But then it will also print out the variable is null because it has not been defined. So it is also null. And that's it for the top 100 PHP functions covering function 21 through 30. In the next video, we're going to cover function 31 to 40. And I hope you guys like this video. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Clever Techie out.